Hello and welcome to the eighth seminar of Hypea Research. Today we'll be discussing teaching methodologies with Deborah's presentation. As you can see on the screen, there will be an initial presentation of 15 minutes, followed by some questions to incentivize debate. Deborah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um... Oh, okay, I, I might have been a bit fast then. <laughs> uh, let's see, Where's my presentation. Uh, okay. I mean, now I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Welcome, Matthias. Uh, awesome. Yes, uh, so, win it. Uh, uh, please re remember to mute yourself so we can all hear um, Deborah unless you're, you're speaking, which will take place during the debate. And I'm just trying to work Buenas tardes, out. Carlitos. Eh, buenas tardes, Victor. Doble veche, Dania. Oh. Eh. Uh, do I? Uh, slideshow. Okay. Um, and do we, this has changed. PowerPoint changes every time. I don't use it very often. <laughs> uh, okay, from the beginning. Right. Ah, got it. Um, okay, so basically, I'm just going to talk about a couple of aspects of second language acquisition, looking at total physical response and uh, a little bit of an example of that, and then looking at Krashen's um, monitor theory 40 years on. Uh, okay, so just the background of total physical response to start off with. Um, it was developed by James Asher, and uh, he came up with it really because he was looking at the fairly weak results coming out of schools where um, language learning was following traditional sort of grammar and translation kind of methods. And after several years of learning in school, um, children really weren't able to speak a language at all. So. Um, a second language that is. So he observed children learning language from their parents and he decided that there were three really important aspects that language is primarily learned by listening, that it should engage the right hemisphere of the brain, which is sort of action related as well as the left, which is more language based generally. So using the whole brain um, and it shouldn't be stressful. It should just be a pleasant, um, joyful sort of experience. So um, he developed the idea of total physical response, which is based more on um, early language learners, not having to produce anything themselves, but just listening and then responding using their whole body. So um, the focus is on recognizing the meaning in the, the spoken words and there's no specific uh, explicit teaching of grammar. Um, just a basic example of a lesson based on TPR would start off with one word commands where, um, gosh, I'm gonna get distracted by the noise even if you can't hear it. <laughs> um, the, the teacher so would say one word and demonstrate the action. So just stand, jump, run, that kind of thing. And the learners would hear the word, see what the teacher's doing and copy their actions. So they're learning from doing. And the example he gave in the paper that um, I shared is doing it in pairs. So a teacher with a, a couple of learners um, copying and performing those actions in pairs. So over a 20 or 30 minute period, the complexity is gradually increased. And he gives one example of towards the end, take that flower from the desk and give it to her. So it's a series of um, requests that the learner gradually comes to understand. <clears throat> in the um, study that he was showing in his paper, he 
um, tested the theory on mainly college students, 18 to 20 year olds. So they would have been, I, I mean, reasonably intelligent to start off with. Um, and he did use some, a younger group for comparison afterwards to have a look at any difference between the age. Um, it was performed over four days. I'll just go briefly because I realize I have only got 15 minutes and I always have too much to say. Um, so he did retention tests afterwards and found that in the retention tests, if um, they were tested by performing the physical action, they did significantly better. If in those tests, all they did was just write down like the English translation of what the action that they saw, they didn't do as well. Um, and he found that even those who didn't perform initially in the teaching part, but ob observed that and then performed the physical actions in the retention tests, they still did reasonably well. So um, it's not necessary then for the students to actually do the physical response themselves. They can observe someone else doing it and learn from that as long as they then um, have the opportunity to do it themselves after. Um, so let's see, what have I got there? Um, introducing translation, he found negated the benefits. So that reduced the effect of the learning. Asking the learners to speak the word after they had heard it also reduced their listening comprehension. So he felt that it was really important that they were given that opportunity to just listen um, and for as long as they needed to. So there could be that silent period at the beginning where they're, they're just learning, comprehending, performing the physical responses, but not being required to try and speak the language themselves. He found in his uh, study that it worked better with older learners. So it worked better with the college students than it did with children. Um, he wasn't sure if this was due to maybe um, attention span with the younger ones, but he also found that even with just one word instructions, the adults actually did it better, which I thought was an interesting point to raise. Um, and then he suggested from that that if there is a limited time available for teaching, that it's really important to focus on the listening because the skills that um, learners develop from the listening can then spread into speaking and the production of language. Um, it can transfer across. So I then had a look at this paper, which um, it was a little difficult to read and mainly because the person obviously was not English first language, so um, was a little confusing at times, but the main point of it was, um, I wanted to look at this one because of the fact that Asha said it was better for older learners, whereas this was looking at using um, teaching children. So in primary school, grades three to four and five to six, um, the whole point of the curriculum seemed to be aimed exactly at this, at using communicative language teaching and using physical response. It seemed to be ideal to meet all the goals that were stated in the curriculum. However, um, it became obvious that the assessments and the testing of the students to see how well they perform were totally based on the old fashioned methods because the assessments were paper based. Um, the study itself wasn't sort of brilliantly done. It was only really a case study looking at a couple of teachers, a couple of students and the parents. Um, so it couldn't really be generalized at all apart from the fact if, if that is the case, if the curriculum is, is pointing in one direction and then all the assessments that they're having to perform to are in a totally different direction, that's not really very useful. Um, the teachers don't seem to be trained in the use of TPR at all. 
And uh, whereas in successful language learning and in, in situations like immersion um, and heritage language style bilingual education, the parents are very involved and that's very important, but the parents in this case didn't seem to be involved at all. Um, didn't, um, the, I, I found it interesting, one child said that she didn't really use English outside of the classroom at all. Whereas the parents said, oh yes, she watches uh, English cartoons and uh, I encourage the children to pronounce the English properly. And I got the impression that perhaps the parent was answering how she thought she should be behaving and perhaps the child's response that she didn't use English outside was actually more honest. I, I mean, that's just guessing, I don't know. But it was an interesting comment. Um, so moving on then to look at um, Krashen. Um, the monitor theory was produced back in the 70s or 80s, that kind of uh, time period. And at the time, a lot of people were very critical of it. Um, they didn't really feel that it could be proven in any way or tested probably. So um, really kind of discounted it. But in this paper, they're saying that actually there's a lot of good basis to it. And in many ways it still applies, but it, the way that it's being expressed now has just changed. Um, so the main three that the paper looked at were the acquisition learning distinction, which is something that Carlos, you did um, a video on not so long ago, yeah, where acquisition is more of a subconscious um, implicit learning process and the learning is the, the conscious being taught learning the grammar rules uh, or that aspect of language learning. The natural order hypo hypothesis then is that um, le learning takes place in a, a, a sort of predictable order really, looking at or comparing it to first language learners to the way that children pick up grammar um, and tend to progress in certain stages. There's a similar pattern in second language learners. And then the input hypothesis, we'll look at all these in more detail in a minute, but the input hypothesis is to do with having comprehensible input that's at the right level, pitched at the right level to extend the learners a little bit, but not be too far beyond them. Um, so today the equivalents are explicit versus implicit learning. So it's similar to acquisition and learning. Um, the natural order has, become ordered development. And the comp comprehensible input now, um, the main talk is about communicatively embedded input. So looking more at the acquisition learning distinction, um, with acquisition, the idea really is that um, the learner isn't, almost isn't aware of what it is that they're learning. They're just focusing on the meaning. They're coming to understand the input that's been given to them. But they're forming this mental picture of how the language works without really realizing what it is that they're learning. Whereas the learning process is very conscious. It's to do with knowing the rules and the, the grammar, the syntax, the structure how everything fits together and focusing on the form of the language rather than the meaning itself. So from the learning process, um, people can describe the, the metalinguistic functions of the language, but not necessarily be able to use it. Um, and it's something that in my own experience, I've seen still happening a lot in language learning classrooms. Uh, in the traditional classes in Wales where they're teaching Welsh, there's a lot of 
focus on teaching the grammatical structure, teaching the pattern, practicing the pattern, and then expecting people to be able to use it. But it doesn't seem to be the case. And I've, I've met people in Wales who have been learning for six or seven years and can quote all sorts of grammar rules, um, but can't actually hold a conversation, which is really sad. They've put an awful lot of work into it and it, it hasn't come about. Um, and I work full time as um, a Welsh and a Welsh tutor and a supporter of early Spanish learners. <laughs> um, and I've seen it as well, even with our course where people can practice the structures and then in a conversational situation, completely forget them. So they're then just using what they've learned implicitly and all that explicit learning has almost gone to waste in some cases. Um, so there was a lot of criticism of the fact that Krashen didn't think um, Deborah, that, just one minute, please. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Gosh, that 15 minutes went fast. So the idea, the main problem with it is um, that Krashen and others since him don't believe that explicit learning can become implicit. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that. So this is basically the same thing, explicit versus implicit. It's just what we've been talking about. I'm just gonna see if, what else I've got that's newer here. Um, so the nat natural order, at the beginning it was focusing on morphemes, um, but now the order development hypothesis is just looking more in a general way um, that learning tends to take place in a certain order. So um, certain features of the language will be learned before others. And that explicit instruction doesn't appear to influence this order at all. It's still something that happens implicitly inside the learner, no matter what the explicit instruction is that's given to them. Um, so then the input hypothesis is the last one. And that's that was criticized because what Krashen said is that comprehensible input needs to be um, plus one from the, the state where the learner is now a little bit more, but was never able to actually define what the current state is and how you could tell that it was a little bit more. So it was all a little bit vague. Um, um, but it, it seems to be um, the case. Um, things like with reading, for, um, for example, if a learner is trying to read in the language and it is too hard, they don't really get an awful lot out of it. The suggestion was that they should be able to understand about 95% and have 5% that they're aiming to increase. Um, Deborah, we need, we need to, to finish somewhere around here. Okay, okay. Uh, let me just see. So quickly, just the implications for language teaching are that explicit teaching and grammar rules should be reduced. There should be a lot more exposure to uh, communicatively embedded input, engaging the learners in the meaning making, um, and there shouldn't be a lot of concern about producing the language initially, focusing on uh, listening and understanding. Uh, that was the references. And uh, my, my question, I really only had the one question that I thought would be interesting to discuss was just that, does the group feel that it is possible for explicitly learned grammar rules to become internalized? Because in the papers and in other reading, there seems to be this feeling that they, they can't. So for me, if they can't, why do we spend so much time learning them or teaching them to people? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Deborah. It was a very informative presentation, full of information and value. 
Uh, thank you also for, for sticking to the, to the timeline of, of those 15 minutes and also for posing a question. Ideally, we want to pose between three and five questions, right? But I think everybody has more or less uh, an opinion on this one question mm -hmm. post. So perhaps we could start uh, there. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to jump on that question? Of why do we teach explicit grammar at all if it's hard for it to become internalized? Oh, uh, I see a lot of hands raised. Uh, I don't know who was first. So let's start with the first one alphabetically here. Uh, Dr. Usman. Uh, thank you. There's a rule that I keep going back to when I think about this, and it is the rule that you have for the past participle uh, in French. Uh, when I was learning it in high school, that if you have to make it female, you'll put the E after, but you don't do it with avoir, you do it with être, except if you put the subject before. And it's so deeply internalized. I put so much effort into understanding that idea that I think I can't let it go. I always think about that all the time when I'm writing something. So I guess if you drill it hard enough, it's possible. What do you guys think? Okay, good question, uh, Osman. So is it possible? Yes. Does that mean it should be adopted? That's the question that that was my posing. So now Matthias and then Timothy. Uh, Matthias? Matthias, are you there? He's on mute. Need to unmute Matthias, please. Okay, uh, I, will be very, I, uh, I will be very briefly, Carlitos. About mm -hmm. TPR, well, first of all, not everybody functions in the same way. Uh, there are polyglots who have the tendency to be much more grammar oriented and more prone to speak first rather than listening first. You mm -hmm. can learn by listening if and only if you can build the grammar structure on the way, but not everybody functions in the same way. And that aspect, not necessarily the TPR takes into account. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, about comprehensible input, um, the comprehensible input, in my opinion, can function better if we rely on context. Uh, once you have acquired enough grammar, I mean, uh, namely uh, at a 2 b one level, more or less at somewhat conversational level, you can focus on specific vocabulary rather than general vocabulary. For example, I have some uh, languages like, for example, Greek, Basque, or Hebrew that in, despite my my vocabulary is A2. Um, I, I can uh, when when I when I focus on sports vocabulary, for example, it increases to be one. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not as clear as it seems. <laughs> well, about uh, briefly, well, about acquisition versus learning. The uh, my I have a question. Uh, how can the process of learning uh, L1, I mean uh, a first language, I mean the acquisition as such be replicated in all the rest of the language we learn, in all the rest of the languages we learn with guaranteed results in adults. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your question, Matthias, which presupposes that it can, right? That this can be done. Your question is how can it be done? Exactly, right. how can it be done? Right. With sure. guarantees, because, because uh, it's, not, it, it's not the same to learn the language as, adult, um, uh, as adults, rather than acquisition. When we, when we talk about acquisition, we talk about the same process that we acquire a uh, first language as, as um, uh, in the right. childhood. With <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, thanks for clarifying. So now, uh, Dr. Timothy. Yeah, thank you very much, Sir Deborah. I'll be very quick. I echo what uh, Matthias uh, just said, that different people have very different learning styles. Uh, Matthias mentioned people who like to speak a lot rather than listen. I, for instance, I'm somebody who likes to write a lot, like short messages on Twitter, for instance, because that, help, that helps to me learn. But my, my question is more general. And um, excuse me if I missed this, but you know, when um, in the theories that you were mentioned and you when people talk about the best way of you know, learning something, what, what, what I... My general impression is that when they say, when, for instance, uh, 
Krashen says the best method is comprehensible input, does he mean comprehensible input is the best for 100% of people or for 50% of people or for 75% of people? Mm -hmm. That's what I always miss in these uh, sort of discussions myself. You know, it's, 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 it's connected to what Matthias just said. You know, people yeah. learn in different ways. And how mm -hmm. is how do these theories, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert in the field by any by any means, but I do see a lot of um, um, you know sort of statistics to say, you know, we conference comprehensible input is the best method, but only for I don't know seventy five plus or minus ten percent of learners, something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, yes, indeed. So the learning preferences question, right? Perhaps there were a uh, can answer that uh, later on. And now is Anja's turn. Hello, everyone. So mm -hmm. I would like, firstly, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So firstly, I would like to give you an example how I acquired certain different languages in different um, stages of my life. And then I would give you some suggestions if it happens the same to you or what do you think about it. So, for example, um, the first languages I had to learn in school were actually English and German. Uh, while uh, Spanish, I acquired it. I didn't even learn it. I just acquired it by uh, by watching soap operas in back in those days and uh, downloading all the programs in Spanish, changing all the games, titles, like actually doing and living my life, changing mm -hmm. everything, not in English, but in Spanish. Well, in English, it was different. Um, I was I had to learn it in school. We had to, um, they forced us, you know, to learn the tenses, mm -hmm. to do the exercise, to do, to do that repeated, um, you know, exercises so that you would learn how the, how the grammar works in English. Right. Um, so I really didn't understand English and I didn't really want to continue learning it. And then I noticed when I was acquiring languages um, later on in life, with Chinese, when there was a chaos, it was better. So that order that I had in, Chinese, in, uh, in English in the classes versus this chaos that I started just playing random games in Chinese and I acquired better vocabulary and better knowledge of Chinese, being able to speak um, just by that chaos. So my theory is that uh, if you make a certain chaos and you expose that person to a chaos, your brain tries to make some order. So you automatically start searching for grammatical rules, for something um, repetitive um, forms in the sentences, something that help you understand. While if there is order, that they already give you some grammar rules and you just have to learn them and memorize them, you don't really you know, understand them and understand the language, but you just, memorize them so i didn't have so much time to memorize all the sentences there are in the word in english so this is why i was not improving in english while well, in a few weeks in chinese i was already able to speak uh, and then again when i was acquiring a language of the same language group it worked perfectly when i was list when i was just doing what uh, asher suggested so over exposing myself to listening materials for example um just to give you an example, my native language is Slovene. So when I was trying to learn Russian, um, I didn't understand Russian before. It's something similar, but I am not able to read Cyrillic. So uh, trying to learn to grammar and seeing that Cyrillic letters make no sense for me. But once that I um, uh, just overexposed myself to a lot, a lot of um, Russian materials, then in a few weeks, my a comprehension grew enormously, but it's not. It was not easy. Easy. I don't know sentences like Saint Pimsleur, if you know the program, mm -hmm. but it was complex. So it was the dialogues in the movies, mm -hmm. in the series, something that is repetitive, something that you can connect with emotionally, and that you want to understand the story. So it can't be a movie because it's short, and there are like effects, you know, music and sounds and visual effects. So you can't hear the story. It has to be something repetitive or a series or shows mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. a lot of episodes so that you can connect with the actors. You already know the story. So you only focus, or you know the characters, mm -hmm. so you only focus on the story and with the story on the words. And with mm -hmm. this, 
you acquire faster. So mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, it happened the same to you. It's easier to just understand a language um, if it's from the same language group by listening and how it mm -hmm. was this chaos was ordered for you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anja. Uh, yes, these are very important points. The, the learning in context and, and emotional anchoring of, of words and sentences and also the human ability and even tendency proclivity to generate order from chaos, right? So that language learning methods may not need to include that ordered structure given that that's already a propensity of, of human beings. Uh, but let's see how common these experiences are or whether your experiences reflect the fact that different learners operate in different ways as, as Tim or Matthias were suggesting. Let's hear it from Tim. Yeah, yes, uh, just very quickly to pick up on Anna's, uh, Anya's point of people making chaos, from, uh, people making order from chaos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think, I have the impression that a lot of the uh, um, ways in which language learning is are presented are intended for group teaching, such as at schools, where structure might actually be more important to convince the group of which direction they are going in. Whereas all of us, you know, have our own um, you know, interests, and so what I think we do is all of those who are in, learn independently, we create our own structure from a sort of chaos. So that's, that was just my two cents. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tim. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Anya? Mm -hmm. well, so I said, you agree, Timothy, with chaos versus order, it's easier to um, uh, find out your own order if there is a chaos in front of you. So if they don't offer you some grammar rules, it's easier for you to just acquire and find out those rules from the examples. Mm -hmm. And Deborah? Um, yes, I was thinking most of these examples and these um, our suggestions for language learning are based on the classroom situation. From what I understand, reading them, they're not for individuals. And there's a big focus on motivation. And the idea with things like TPR and using comprehensible input is that the learners will be more motivated because it's something within their grasp. The especially the physical movements, they're more involved in it. It's not just sitting at a desk learning. So there's a lot of trying to uh, motivate the learners to actually learn. Whereas all of us, we don't need anything like that. We're so motivated to learn languages. That part is not necessary at all. And mm -hmm. to me, a lot of us are very interested in the grammar and those sorts of things. We want to know for our own curiosity, not because we need it necessarily to no. be able to use the language and speak, but because we are fascinated by it and we want to understand how the languages work. Mm, that's a very important point. So the fact that we do it doesn't mean that it is because we think we need it, but it might just be our curiosity or motivation to explore that, that rule explicitly. Mm -hmm. Any other any other comments to that? I was I was surprised by the, I was pretty unsurprised by the fact that and a very important point that, that Deborah made in her presentation, which is that the benefits of TPR can be gained by observing people's actions rather than doing those actions yourself. And that might have its basis in what is called mirror neurons, in the fact that our there are certain neurons we possess that tend to mirror the act the actions we see, and we can learn from that scene, because in a certain way our neurons incorporate that which we're seeing as a form of doing it. 
So it's not exactly the same, but it does have a, a relation to it. So I guess that's why observing TPR and engaging in, in those actions can both work at some, at some points. And then another point I wanted to make is when uh, Deborah referred to other approaches as old fashioned, it caught my attention because sometimes you can distinguish between traditional approaches and innovative pedagogical approaches. But here, TPR was opposed to old fashioned approaches, which begs the question, to what extent is TPR a fad or something that is in vogue and rather than a method that has been offering consistent result for all kinds of learners as opposed to just a certain profile of learner, right? Um, have you encountered that, that accusation before and how have proponents of TPR reacted to it, uh, Deborah? Um, I was thinking about this because um, I, at the time, when I started learning French in school when I was sort of 11, 12 years of age, um, and I was super motivated. I'd been asking to learn for years and being told I was too young. So I was really keen. But the, thinking back to those language classes, the only thing I really remember is when we played Simon D. So Simon D touche le nez, Simon D touche la tête. All of those mm -hmm. physical actions, standing up in the classroom, doing them. It's the only I did for two years. I did introductory French. It's the only thing I remember. So mm -hmm. it really stuck in my mind mm -hmm. and I it, it made a big difference. The rest of the time it was just sitting at the desk, you know, reading little passages, doing translation, doing dictation. Um, mm -hmm. So. I don't know if I've lost the track now, but <laughs> so yeah, um, I think it's something that's always been there. I think something mm -hmm. that that a good language teacher would always incorporate into the mm -hmm. class to make mm -hmm. sure there is a variety of learning going on mm -hmm. so that all of the learners, no matter what their learning style is, gets an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. And and you, so and you just just before um before um, changing over to Matthias. And do you think that the fact that it was always there in some form or fashion does also entail that it was always already conceptualized as such? So people were using those techniques, but were they also calling it TPR specifically and referring to a specific body of scholarly literature? I don't, I don't think they were. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't really know, but I don't think they were. I think it was just part of yeah. um, a good teacher's exploration of how can I teach right. a range of ways, right. and this mm -hmm. is a way I can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, now, Matthias. I will be very brief. Um, I, want, I, I wonder myself how effective is TPR uh, on a basis that one of the flaws that method has is to learn the four skills at the same time when we know perfectly that uh, as I mean not every human can learn all the four skills at the same time. Uh, in fact, um, uh, when we are evaluated in um, in a CEFR, the Common European Framework, uh, I, the, I mean the the, the language level exams. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems that when 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 you when you have to when you have to acquire a specific level, you have to uh, to to credit uh, to to show th th that level in all the four skills, but not necessarily functions as such. I mean, for example, when I, when I speak Greek, I am I have more more or less some kind of A2 level or B1 level to, in speaking. But when I uh, try to uh, present myself in a Japanese um, in A2 level of Greek in May 30, 2019, I failed. Why? Paragogy grapulo, it means the written production, it wasn't, it wasn't good for an A2 level. I, I consider it unfair, but that, that's, 
that's um, that's a reason because I I can I cannot learn a language in all levels uh, at the same time. It's like the the equalizer in the sounds when there was one uh, increases and the other decreases at the same. Not not everybody, mm -hmm. but everybody functions the same way. I mean, you you don't acquire uh, at, uh, or, or you don't acquire the same level in all those four for for skill areas in the same moment. That's that the point. And sometimes you it needs some time of more time to develop than the others. Just that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthias. So yeah, taking into account those four skills and the extent to which people develop one of them more than than the others. And now, Anja. Uh, hello. So first, I would like to agree with Deborah, which is that I had similar experience um, in Erasmus exchange while learning Slovak. So we also had an amazing teacher and she also finds a way for us to memorize better. For example, we were playing the game Spot It. I don't know if you remember, if you know it, but no. uh, you know, you do. No, no. So, okay, okay. Can you can you explain what that is? Uh -huh. So it's there are like um, Okay, I don't have it here with me. They are like uh, cards in the circle of paper. There are different um, characters um, printed on. And mm -hmm. um, there, there are different people who have to notice on the, the circle in the middle the same character that they have in their hand. So you divide those cards uh, in that circle shape to different people. And uh, then they have to notice the right, the same uh, picture in their among the pictures in their hand as it is in mm -hmm. the center and the one mm -hmm. who goes it faster you know and so you keep putting it on and the one who gets it faster wins but at the same mm -hmm. time you have to say this word aloud so you see um when we were learning this new word vocabulary in the foreign language with this game we wanted to be the first you know to want to want to be the first who gets the right um card mm -hmm. on the top so, and we learned all that vocabulary, we practiced all the, this new vocabulary. We were so happy that we actually know so good, we can play a game with it. Um, but it was also very interesting, uh, now, uh, something else. We were, mm -hmm. the teacher, she was speaking since the beginning all the time in Slovak, but we were all mm -hmm. Slavs with Germans uh, inside in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But in, even though we all understand Slavic people, uh, what she was saying more or less, in the end, in the test, Germans had the 100 top scores, even though if they didn't understand anything during the classes. But we, in the end, we mix this language with our native languages, and we were horrible at the test. So what is actually then the point of knowing the language, or how can you say you know a language if uh, those who didn't understand anything got the best score, and those who supposedly understood everything and communicate with teacher, in the end, get the worst grades? So, I don't know. I would like to hear your opinion on that. What do you think? What is mm -hmm. that actually the knowledge of language when you get the best score because it shows that you learned everything or when you actually understand from the beginning everything, even though you are not the best at the tasks? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, do, how do we measure, how do we assess uh, people's proficiency in an exam? Yeah, mm -hmm. always a recurring question. Mm. Let's see what like people think. But it, yeah, I wasn't familiar with the with the spotted game. Um, so when you say Anja that that the Germans did not understand what what uh, the professor was saying, what the teacher was mm -hmm. saying. What, was, what, 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 yes. What do you mean exactly? Not, not like they, they lacked, uh, li they lacked uh, listening or reading skills, or you're specifically talking about listening? Hmm. So we were Erasmus students. We had no basic knowledge of this language. We came in mm -hmm. the country. We were exposed to the language, of course, in our daily life. But as Erasmus students, we mostly connected with other Erasmus students. We didn't have contact with natives. So if you didn't spoke with the bus driver or the seller, you didn't spoke the language. You were not exposed to the language. We didn't interact with students that speak this language as a native. So we didn't speak or hear the language except around in the country. So when we came in the class, the teacher, she was speaking all the time in Slovak. 
She yes. explained some some rules, maybe in English, but mostly she explained everything and she spoke all the time just slow. Yes. But because we were Slavs, we somehow understood from the context what she meant. She was moving, she was, you know, okay. smiling. Okay. She was using but, the body language. But the Germans, of course, they couldn't understand. It was a totally different language. Uh, so this is what I'm saying. But in the end, the test, they were, they all got more than 100, I mean, the best scores. Well, we got maybe six, seven from the yeah. ten um, of the grades. So, okay, so, you, so you're talking about listening, not reading. Listen. And, and uh, the test, what kind of exercises did the test include? Uh, just oral and written production from the students or also listening and reading exercises? Yes, it was the normal test, like we get in school. So we had to write down, we had to speak. But when she wrote down certain words, she was speaking all the time. She was explaining everything in that language. She didn't use English, you know, to explain the Slovak. She used the language that we were learning to explain the language, which was amazing for us because we were overexposed to the language and we were forced to make some connection, to communicate with her, to answer her. And with her body gestures and and the way she motivated us to start speaking and expressing ourselves. So we did it. We sometimes mix it with our languages. We maybe misspell something, but oftentimes we just figure it out. We get the right endings. We made the right sentences. While the Germans, they said, it's so horrible. We can't understand anything. We can't gather, it's too much information. Uh, well, for us, it was maybe even not enough. You know, It was not just basic conversation, not the text. Mm -hmm with one half a page and now you read it because maybe we could understand it all just a few words you can't understand so this is that overexposure that um that states i plus one uh, i think the question man mentions so this is you understand 40 95 97 percent of the text it's foreign language but yes there are some words that you don't understand and this is plus one so we were not ex overexposed you know in this case so we didn't have enough but like mm -hmm. for Germans, it was already too much. So this is why I'm I'm saying it was an amazing experience. We played so much, we enjoyed. But in the end, in the tests, we were not, you know, as good as we were supposed to be from our from experience that how good we could express ourselves and how good we could understand. So how would you measure? But just, just, yes. just to clarify, those tests tested all four skills. Listening, breathing, writing, yes. and yes. speaking. Yes, okay. but in the right. in the way when it was um, audio, when we had to uh, listen, she was the one who was speaking. It was not some audio random played, you know, okay. as it's okay. usually in the test. So we had we had an um, exercise of some grammar, some words, vocabulary, uh, something incomprehensible, and I I'm not sure, but maybe even some text to write, but like a few sentences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to relate their experience to that, to, to that experience that Anja was sharing? Because I, I personally don't remember uh, an equivalent experience at Deborah. Um, I was just thinking about that, but the, the sort of testing idea. And one of the problems I think in, um, in schools in a way is that everything gets a lot of the testing is done on paper and things are either right or wrong and it's in um, the company I work with trying to get adults who have been through that in school to realize that it's okay to make mistakes is a huge barrier for some of them they're, they're so used to being told at school no that's wrong no that's wrong no that's wrong and we try and say to them, look, if you, you're trying to think of a word and in your mind you're thinking, oh, I, I think it begins with a, with a diff sound and, and it's got like two or three syllables, then you know something about that word you, and it shouldn't be in a test or in an assessment. If you can't mm -hmm. get the whole word out, then mm -hmm. it's not wrong. There right. should be ways of accepting that people yes. can make mistakes, people can yeah. make approximations yeah. of the language and still be understood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that should be assessed mm -hmm. yes in, in uh, for instance in uh, nyu where i teach what we do is in the exam if there's a gap that they need to fill out and there is a reasonable approximation we will give 
half of the points. However, if the student, so we, 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 we will not give points, but we will not detract as much as many points. So we'll detract, for instance, we'll subtract uh, 0 0.7, right? But if the same student leaves the gap empty, does not bother to, to write anything, then we will detract twice as much from that punctuation. So we will, it will be minus 1.5, right? So that's, that's one way of encouraging people to produce approximations, even if they think they don't know the exact right answer in case there is one, right? Uh, Tim? Yes, thanks very much. Just following on from what Deborah said, I have the impression in general that, you know, um, tests for languages tend to favor accurate, test for accuracy rather than test for fluency, which is my, yeah. And I think it's also connected with the fact that Accuracy is much easier to test using methods that are available. So that testing accuracy can result in a less, a lower workload. It can even be done by computer nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is why I think as, as people who are just good at ac who may be accurate but not fluent are favored over those who are fluent but not accurate. I know many mm -hmm. people who are very, very fluent in English. But when you see them, especially when you see them write, they are very inaccurate. Yeah. I think so. I think it's just a general comment, but I, I agree with you. And I think there should be more um, sort of testing or fluency or just more recognition that tests are designed mainly to test accuracy rather than fluency. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, I, I would agree with that. And a way in which we're trying to move away from accuracy based testing towards fluency based testing, for instance, is role playing uh, exams as opposed to, to a general um, unstructured oral exam. So, with role playing, you can really showcase your fluency without needing to be accurate because at the end of the day, you're just representing a role rather than speaking for yourself. And it does allow and shows different angles, I think. And it does allow to to that does allow us to factor in fluency rather than accuracy. Whereas something written, as in a written exam, I think is always going to favor uh, accuracy. So yeah, it's just um, finding not necessarily different methods of testing with which to replace written exams, but um, but broadening the specter of testing methods right um okay anya uh i wanted to reply to this um uh, comment of yours about tests mm -hmm. for example i remember from my experience uh i never understood like they were giving exams from put from distance to distance and you know exercises like that but once they gave an example how to put what actually they want from me you know put it from this sentence to that even if it was just an example then I knew what they want, but just saying mm -hmm. from this tense to another tense, I had no idea what the examiner wants from me. I didn't know if I would write it correctly in what form, you know. Yeah. And also, how do you suggest uh, if anybody has any ideas? How would someone test fluency? Um, we already mentioned the role play, but mm -hmm. what else do you suggest? What could be used to test the fluency instead of accuracy? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think another method would be time constraint assessment. So you give a certain amount of time for a participant to say write a 10, 10 line paragraph, right? At that point, the, the person who can produce the most uh, discourse in that amount of time is more fluent in, in the written discourse, even if he or she is not as accurate, right? But that incentivizes the production of discourse and leaves accuracy concerns in the second place, putting a time constraint. Whereas if you have all the time uh, of, the, of the day, then you can, you can uh, optimize for accuracy and not care as much about fluency and trying to second guess every word you're writing, right, for instance. Uh, but let's see what other people think. How can we test for fluency rather than accuracy? Carlos, can I ask you just something? Yes. You said uh, time limited, um, you know, mm -hmm. time limited exercise. Mm -hmm. 
but mm-hmm. uh, would you give them uh, a title? You know, you have to speak about... Um, yes, the prompt, people's... right? Like, yeah, to ah, talk so about your favorite topic. writer from the 20th century. Okay, so there would be different topics that they would be able to prepare in advance or just some random that they wouldn't have any idea what could be. Because Not the idea, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I remember um, from German tests that uh, I had, I was, you know, there was a little papers and I had, I <clears throat> took one and I had to speak about old people's homes or something like that in German that even in, I didn't know anything about in my native language. So if there is a topic you even don't know anything in your, your native language, how can you express it in foreign language? So there should be those tests about topics that you already discussed or talked about, or at least that you know. So um, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, uh, as, as you know, I don't, I don't really make the distinction between native and foreign languages, but what I do is I don't think it's, it's beneficial if you want to test fluency to let people know what the topic is going to be. And I found in my experience in the classroom teaching other people, I found that detrimental to their, to their fluency. So for instance, we organize a debate around uh, fast food. Can fast food be made amenable to a white population without having so many uh, health issues and problems and so on, right? And so, if I tell people in advance, students in advance, they're going to prepare their little speech and what they do is they come to class and even though they know it's a debate, they will pull up their screen, look at the screen and say, okay, pienso que la comida rápida and, and read, right, off the screen. And I always say the same, you're defeating the whole purpose of the debate. The whole purpose of the debate is to simulate a real life, real life like conversation to test for fluency. If you're reading off the screen, all I can test for is the accuracy with which you prepare these at home. Yes, but what if you gave like 60 different topics? They can't prepare to all 60 of them and learn all the speeches in a day or two. So that they just have an idea. uh, Yeah, right. Well, idea in their native language. What do you think? In that case, then it will balance out a little bit more the testing for accuracy and testing for fluency, but the less they know in advance what the topic is going to be, the more you can test for fluency. That's what I'm saying. So if you already have traditional exams that that over test for accuracy, and you want to balance it out with exercises that test almost exclusively for fluency, I think the less they know in advance, the better. But that's that's just uh, my experience in the classroom. Maybe other, other people have other experiences. Does anybody have any other experiences? Are you also teachers or um, in person or online? And in the meanwhile, as a student, I also had one experience with this, which was the Cambridge um, proficiency exam, right? And in, I was asked the question of what is the most uh, important writer of the 20th century in your opinion, right? And write about it in like 25 minutes. And that allowed me to, to rush a little bit in my production of written discourse, but really to engage with what I was writing to the point of uh, leaving accuracy in the second place. It was not so much a concern at that point. Uh, and I, I thought it, it worked really well and I had a really good score. Um, and I was very, more than anything else, I was satisfied with the experience regardless of the score. Uh, Victor? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Speaking about Personal, personal experiences. As a kid, as a, as a, as a, as a children, uh, I learned French and uh, and English. But my highest motivation was reading because I started reading books, uh, and books were uh, were cheaper in in English and in French. Mm-hmm. The same books I I, I I read in Portuguese. So one day I started buying this, those books and since I had buy, bought them with my own money, that was kind of uh, monetary motivation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then as an adult, uh, uh, today I learned by translation, I learned all, all, most of what I learned uh, in Dutch was by translation, like uh, we had uh, an online course, and uh, uh, actually we had 
we previewed, we had the team to, to discuss, and I prepare, previously prepared the, the, everything by in writing. So uh, for me, writing is much easier, and now translating is much easier because we can use automatic translation, and provided you have a basic grammar, uh, it's easy to do a translation correctly it and uh, learn by doing it. Uh, like you learning learning for for mm -hmm. to kid for Slavic idioms uh, languages it makes it very easy because uh, of the similarity in grammar and in both in there's about uh, 40 to 60 percent similarity among each of the Baltic language. So you, what you learn in one, uh, learn, you learn in another, in another at the same time. So it's a, it's a, it's a special experience. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Victor. And uh, Anja wants to comment on Victor or any other uh, topic. Uh, yes, actually, about this. I already talked about before how it's easier it was for me to acquire this language from the same language groups, knowing already the same one language of that group. So it happened to me with Spanish and Portuguese later on in Italian and with knowing already Slovenian with Russian, um, just by overexposing myself to listening comprehension. So for that, when you know already one language from the same language group, from my experience, it works overexposing yourself to that new language because you already have basis, strong basis in another similar language. But my question is, what would you think or what would you understand as that plus one? I think in input hypothesis of Russian, Kras, I'm sorry, I don't know the right pronunciation of Russian. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so that plus one, what is for you plus one? Uh, if I understand it right for me, because there was a lot of debate what actually means that plus one, how to actually measure that plus one. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, um, when you, you already speak a certain language, then plus one is you have a simple text in front of you, you read it all and you understand the, the basic idea what is the text about. There are just a few words you don't understand in the text. That is, in my opinion, that E plus one, um, I plus one. I don't know how it, is it uh, called. But, uh, for example, this is when you already uh, have uh, an advantage that you speak the language of, of the same group. But when you start from a language, when you have no idea uh, of how the grammar is structured, how the, the sounds are pronounced, and so on, which happened, for example, with me with Chinese, um, that I plus one was already, if I learn certain, certain words and certain basic sentences, which is, I like dog, I don't know, just the simple, um, three sentence, uh, three word sentence or something like that. And you just learned a new word to add in the same sentence. So mm -hmm. already using the same sentence, just yeah. changing um, some words, mm -hmm. already uh, that input, the extra input. Yeah. So okay. from my experience, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, uh, b before going to Deborah, um, I plus one is, is essentially you take your current level in that language and you add a little bit extra of comprehensible input in that language. And that can be done in, in a lot of different ways, right? And one of them is, is the ones you mentioned, but a good example is this collection of uh, whatever language in 10 minutes a day. Can you see it? This is Hebrew in 10 minutes a day, right? And this collection of books is famous for many reasons, but one of them is that they use this comprehensible input I plus one technique. And what they do is, this is intended for English speakers that want to learn that language, right? So in this case, Hebrew. So what they do is this, as you can see here, you have a paragraph in English, but the, here and there, there's a word in Hebrew. That's the plus one. These are very simple words in Hebrew that anybody can understand at that level because they were taught in the previous pages, but no more than that. Everything else is in English. That's an example of I plus one. That's an example. That's an example of I plus one in practice. Um, Deborah? Um, yes, I was just going to sort of explain I plus one in the same way. 
but um i i'm sort of working out for myself in in basque how to actually do that because um what i found is that trying to understand spoken basque is really difficult and okay. so i'm trying to find sort of a level of spoken basque somewhere somehow that i can understand and the way i've done it is to set up some language partners so um and they're very good they they're actually quite good at speaking a little bit more slowly to me uh, mm -hmm. pausing to make sure i understand rephrasing mm -hmm. if i don't quite so they're helping me to get in and I'm right. finding because of that, I can then sort of leapfrog on that and understand more of the normal input. But also with reading, I got a bit discouraged with trying to read because mm -hmm. even a magazine, which is supposed to be for adult Basque learners was just incomprehensible. Um, mm -hmm. So I've now got a collection of children's books that a friend is bringing around <laughs> at a regular basis. Right. And right. this, sentence structure is more simple there's still lots of words i don't understand but it is a, it's just in between it's a bit it's beyond what i know but it's not leaping the full way into you know um full adult sort of magazine material so mm -hmm. it's just that way of extending a little bit i think is what the whole plus one thing is about you said right. there were children's stories was it bothering for you as an adult to have to lower yourself on a level to a child or it was interesting no i actually find them really interesting <laughs> i don't know if it's my my sort of level of enjoyment or what but but i'm i'm enjoying it because the language is actually quite interesting in them the structure of it but also because i can understand it i can read it I can mm -hmm. read whole sentences and think I actually understood every word in that sentence. So I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of reading them. And then mm -hmm. it, it's helping me to move on. And I'm finding now I can read um, news reports and different things. I get news coming through on my phone and I find it giving me that little bit of um, a sort of step up so that I can then get into more adult mm -hmm. material. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, so I think uh, Pimsleur, for instance, is a good example of uh, comprehensible input when it comes to listening. So you might say that it's very repetitive and there are certain drawbacks to it, but it's, it's just an example. And then this um, te In 10 Minutes a Day series by Fripp's book is also another example. The problem is that there is no Basque edition of that In 10 Minutes a Day um, collection. And I don't know if there's a Basque course for Pimsleur either. So that's that's a problem with that, uh, Anja. Yes, I, about Pimsleur, I I tried different uh, languages, the those that I speak, just to try out how good are they, if I can advance better or not. So with mm -hmm. Pimsleur, I noticed it's for a total beginners. So you have no idea, and if you don't speak any other language of the same language group, because if right. you do, it's too simple. If you have no idea what the language is, then the Pimsleur is perfect because with dialogues helps you to understand that new language. Mm -hmm. But also it's made for male. So if you're female, uh, you, get, uh, you can articula articulation or pronunciation, you could get the wrong pronunciation. You have to hear more how the female speak of that totally different mm -hmm. language. It's too much for a male and American. So uh, you have to put this into account. Mm -hmm. just from my experience mm -hmm. yes i i would i would agree with that well mm -hmm. uh, in that sense i can assure you uh, that uh, may, maybe it could be useful for me remember that i learned the basque in three years chatting every day and it wasn't easy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow you still you still practice it matthias well honestly i i, I don't have uh, right now, too much opportunities to to practice Euskera, but uh, when I have the chance, uh, I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Any any more comments, or should we start? Uh, Anja, go ahead. Yeah, I have just one last question. Oh, one last question uh, about uh, fluency of understanding of certain level of languages. When you acquire certain language, 
do you always stay on the same level or you or you notice uh, that you are becoming less fluent or you have st you struggle expressing yourself in that language um from my experience when i learn certain language i never forget it anymore but i met so many people who said i spoke that language for so many years i've been in that country for a few years but now that i returned or came in another country i forgot that language because i don't know um so what is your experience once you acquire a language you never forget it or if you don't practice it so often if you don't listen to it if you don't listen mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. i don't know uh, that language well, you forgot. Yeah. That that's a whole new that's a whole new debate. Um, and we only have two minutes, so please, uh, I'm going to ask you, Tim and Victor, to keep it brief, so we can move to the topic of the next meeting. Uh, Tim and then Victor. Okay, very brief. I think when people talk about forgetting, the word "forget a language" is very is open to a great deal of interpretation, and many people will claim, in my experience, that they've forgotten a language. When they haven't actually forgotten it they've just got out of practice which is something different okay that's all yeah. Me. yeah 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 my, my experience too uh victor very very quickly uh i started russian on my own uh, at about 1988 uh, but when i restarted uh, about two, two three years ago i still remembered everything i, I didn't lose what i had to learn uh, and also when i started to uh, doing four Slavic languages at the same time. Sometimes I, I experience, I, I do, I have a, a teacher, a, a teacher for each language, and I do sessions one time, once a week. But uh, sometimes uh, one a week, I experience like a jump in, in influence in all of them. Uh, like that week, yes, that, uh, that same week, I, I, I still I have more fluency in, in all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, Victor and um, Deborah. So just quickly, I just wanted to say that I, I studied Japanese back in like 1996, 97, something like that. Um, and even went to um, a college for a year and, and was studying it and, and reached a, a reasonable sort of level and then didn't use it ever since. And just recently, I've started just messing around on Duolingo and another thing, Lingo Deer and playing. And I am absolutely stunned that when that, the kanji come up, I look at it and go, oh yes, I remember that. And things that I didn't know that I knew are just yeah. all coming flooding back. So I don't think you yeah. do forget. I think they just, you know, right. go, you can't actually access them easily, but they do come yeah. back. Yeah, and, and there is there is evidence in this in, in in the very semantics we use, for instance, in English, as in it is in the back of my mind or um, tip of the tongue kind of uh, phenomena that indicate that yeah, forgetting is way too broad and definitive and absolute a category to be useful. Um, last intervention for Victor, and that'll be the end of it because we're out of time. Victor. Oh, nothing. I just put something in the chat for the suggestion of uh, new team. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Thank you. And now let me share the screen with some suggestions for the topic of our next meeting. If, of course, if you also have additional suggestions, you can just type it on the chat as we do usually. I'm going to remind you to please choose just one letter that corresponds to the topic as opposed to, to two or three or four letters just one to streamline the process so these are some of the topics that i would like to suggest but please feel free to um either veto some of the topics or add new topics okay so language and, polit and geopolitics polyglossal ownership companies as the privatization of commons which is a Carlos de Guzman discussion so far. Uh, language and politics, Russian and Ukrainian. I've added this recently. I took the liberty of doing so, but uh, Usman, please feel free to, to veto that if you think it's inappropriate or anybody else for that matter. Um, why locals respond in English when addressing the local language, contrastive analysis in multilingual translations and post-colonial and decolonial linguistics. All right, so. Let us see what people
people are writing in the chat. Um, okay, so Victor with the yes, I'm I'm learning Hebrew, Matthias. Um, so uh, uh, Victor with a new theme suggesting the influence of inaccuracy of translation over mutual understanding of people historically. I'm thinking especially about Slavic versus Roman language translations because I've forgotten. Okay. okay, so let's call Victor's new theme suggestion uh, G, right? So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and Victor's suggestion could be G, if you want to explore that in our next meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have C, D. I'm going to go for the C. Um, I uh, actually can't be here for the next two, so I think I won't uh -huh. vote. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. That's that's, that's right. I'll just possible. make a comment before yeah. we proceed. Um, in Hypea research, I think it is okay to discuss a topic like C because it'll be done from a neutral, mature, and academic perspective. So I think that that's good and healthy because I think we'll be respectful of both points of view or all points of view. So I think mm -hmm. for Hypea, point C is a good one. Thank you. All right, perfect. Yeah, that's, I completely agree with that. And that's why I, I included that upon that uh, assumption. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so we have three, yeah, three votes so far. Um, I, four I, four. I, have, I have also a new thing to add uh, as a letter H. Uh, it's also about language and geopolitics. It's about how functions, I mean, the JALS accommodation communication theory and uh, the case of, for example, server creation. Yes, uh, but it's too late now, Matthias. First, because oh, we've okay. already started voting, and second, because we already have so many seats that it doesn't matter. Three months later, that's... no, no worry. Yeah, we, we, I'll, I'll be happy to include that for our next session. But now C is a clear winner because Victor meant to write C, Usman wrote C, Angia wrote C, I wrote C, so, and there's no other D to support uh, team's choice. So even if Matthias were to choose D, it will still be two. So I think it's C for next meeting, right? So we're going, and now, now we have to choose who is going to present. That's the delicate part. Choosing was easy. But who wants to present? Uh, well, 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 Victor knows very well ru uh, Russian language. So uh, it seems that's more accurate for Victor to present it. And the Korean, uh, who, and Ukrainian. He knows as well Ukrainian, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Who else, who else yeah, wants I'm to? Learning, um, no, I'm, I have no reasonably Russian. I'm learning Ukrainian. Uh, okay. Who, 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 else, who else wants to present uh, his, her candidacy? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> Enough for Victor to laugh. Okay, so it goes to Victor. Victor will be presenting next month, okay? Okay. All right, so as soon as I have the readings or watchings from Victor, again, we'll run the poll and have the meeting in the last week of March. Last right. weekend of March, yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. For me, Any it's more? a great honor to be here with you uh, to mm -hmm. share in Hypia research. Sure, absolutely, Matthias. And the pleasure is ours to have you here. So, so, with that being said, is there any other comment? No. Okay. So, thank you very much for partaking, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao.